What's up? What's up, y'all? This is Sean. I'm coming to y'all with this live stream video. Just want to want to let you know that this is the Thought Decoder. And I'm coming to you to keep saying I'm coming to you like I'm a rapper. But this is the bedroom philosopher, the thought decoder, bringing you a new video that is going to cover anti-intellectualism within the church. And then mainstream Christianity. <sighs> so where do I begin? I'm just reflecting on a apologetics and being African American. That's a word that not many people in, in the churches that I grew up in, which is like a Pentecostal church ever heard uh so I rarely heard that word and i i'm a philosopher by training by study and i am african-american as well apparently but it's just difficult to engage my community in rational argumentation uh, and evidence, uh, et cetera. Those things are looked upon as being somehow against the work of God. So they are incompatible with the work of the Holy Spirit. For example, if you, when a minister is ministering, they almost believe that the Holy Spirit gives them the interpretation of Scripture. They say things like, you need to pray before you read your Bible so that the Holy Spirit can illuminate your understanding. Psychologically, it would seem then that if, if you prayed that prayer before you read your Bible and you came to some thought or belief or interpretation of according to Scripture, based on your reading, you would think that the Holy Spirit had actually given you that interpretation. And that's okay, but until, well, I, I guess it's not really okay because it's possible that the Holy Spirit did give you that interpretation, but But how do you know? Right? So I think that's the problem is the showing. Uh is not the not necessarily the, the knowing in as much as it is the showing. So how are you gonna show someone that the Holy Spirit gave you that interpretation? Are you gonna point to the context of the verse and explain how that interpretation best explains the the features and the facts that come from that chapter of the verse that you read or uh, the content of Paul? Uh, are you going to support it by what he, he used other and said and uh, taught or preached in other places within the New Testament? Or are you going to say, believe me because the Holy Spirit gave this to me? If that's what you're going to do, then 
doesn't that stop any discussion? Aren't you assuming the very thing that you were trying to prove? So it's like a circle of reasoning. Uh, unfortunately, this reliance upon the spirit uh, within the Pentecostal denomination leads to an anti-intellectualism because there's an assumption that if you rely on the spirit, then you cannot rely on or you cannot have your belief supported by uh, objective evidence, argumentation, etc. cetera. Uh, so that if you are relying, so if you're reading the Bible, but then you go to a different language that the Bible is written in to try to get a better understanding of the context and the, the, the message that the writer is trying to communicate. It's look, you're looked upon as doing something that is unnecessary or something that is going to block the Holy Spirit from even speaking to you. Oh, he can't speak to you if you, you know, you're studying commentaries on the scripture and you're looking up the original languages, etc. There's also another problem uh, with with this anti-intellectualism. Uh, and let's define that. I'm thinking that anti-intellectualism is this avoidance of information that comes from sources outside of scripture. I think that's a good way to put it. So if you're studying the history of some book or a person, biblical person, and you're trying to bring that in and with that information, you are trying to draw some conclusions about maybe theology or doctrine or some teachings of the scripture, then the anti-intellectualism says, time out. You're doing something wrong. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to get the spirit's meaning from the verse. But this whole talk about the spirit speaking and all of this kind of stuff. The Holy Spirit is a person. Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. As such, the Holy Spirit is omniscient and everywhere at all times and all powerful and all knowing, having all of the properties of God. However, uh, the way that it's attributed to God as speaking doesn't seem to me to, to be uh, necessary. It's necessarily true. Like, oh, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me, which kind of assumes that the Holy Spirit is doing something in the present moment. And I'm not one of these people who don't think that God can intervene in reality and that he must be outside of time and just like a mastermind. But couldn't, couldn't it be I guess this is the problem. They, when people say things like that, they neglect the human part. They neglect themselves. Like the Holy Spirit could uh, have put me in certain situations to where through his design and his foreknowledge, and uh, I'm a Molinist, so I think God knows the free choices of human beings. And he puts them in certain places, kind of like it says in Acts 17. And I'll read that.
Paul says in Acts 17 and 24, the God who, who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us for in him we live and move and have our being as even some of your poor own poets have said for we are indeed his offspring being then god's offspring we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image formed by the art and imagination of man the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So I believe that God puts people in different places at different times, uh, according to the scripture. Uh, However, if I'm reading my Bible and I say, God told me this, what does that mean? Does that mean that God whispered in your ear and said that? Most people audibly, most people are, oh, no, no, not audibly. So what can we, did you have that thought? So did you have a thought? Yes, did you was the thought just did the thought just appear in your mind? If yes, then maybe that maybe that could be God or it could be you or, or it could be both. God in you. Like God has put you in a certain situation to where the thought that you have is the thought he wants you to have because of the effect on you and how that thought will lead you to do his his will. Uh so that in that sense, in the sense that the thought is ordained of God and desired of God to bring about his, his will, then we could say God told you. But if that's true, then if, if that's true in that sense, then God, literally God didn't tell you. God affirmed that belief. God, God influence that belief he put you in the circumstances that you would freely come to that belief and the belief is god ordained because it's, it's according to his will it's according to his purpose but this anti-intellectualism would even would even disagree with my characterization of of this communication between god and the christian believer So when you move into apologetics within circles like the Pentecostal circle, let's see what apologetics is defined as. Okay, Wikipedia says, let's see, the apologetics is a systematic defense of a religious position. So uh, apologetics comes from apologia, speaking in defense, is the religious discipline, discipline of defending religious doctrines through systematic argumentation and discourse. Early Christian writers who defended their beliefs against critics and recommended their faith to outsiders were called Christian apologists. In 21st century usage, Apologetics is often identified with debates over religion and theology. Okay. So 
It's a systematic defense of religious doctrines. And you do that through argumentation and discourse. You can respond to those who have written and etc. So it's the problem with the anti-intellectualism of a denomination like Pentecostals is the systematic argumentation part. Because an argument is, according to Wikipedia again, and logic and philosophy, an argument is a series of statements called the premises or premises intended to determine the degree of truth of another statement, the conclusion. The logical form of an argument in a natural language can be represented in a symbolic formal language and independently. Okay, so argumentation is a natural formal process. You can write out your arguments. You can read your arguments. You can evaluate arguments, etc. It's kind of like editing a paper or writing a paper or essay. So if that's the way uh, you support your doctrines, you defend the doctrines, then the anti-intellectuals will, will say something. Well, that's you doing that. That's not the spirit. And you're going outside of scripture. Okay. So, so the anti-intellectualism has at least two parts that we've thus identified. It's this belief that if you go beyond scripture, outside extra biblical uh, studies and extra biblical argumentation and, 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 and reasoning that go, that is outside the books of the Bible. Or if you don't explicitly uh, claim to rely on the spirit, for information, then that is considered taboo. Uh, no, that's not the right way to go about things. Uh, in these circles, they often talk about head knowledge, and which is an interesting uh, label to 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 begin to think about because head knowledge you can contrast head knowledge with heart knowledge. So it's a different source of, of warrant. And I completely agree with Alvin Plantinga that the Holy Spirit can validate his existence and his presence in us. But I also agree with William Lane Craig, who makes a distinction between knowing and showing. I can't show you that God exists. Uh, subjectively right because by definition my my subjective experience can only be experienced by me so i can't show you that but what i can show you is that something that it is objective and the the basis for apologetics can be found as far as i know in in in, in two verses of, of the bible the first one being Romans 1, and I'll read that. Romans 1. So Romans 1 says, from Paul, a slave of Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, this gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Spirit concerning Holy Spirit, Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was a descendant of David with reference to the flesh, who was appointed the son of God in power, according to the Holy Spirit, by the resurrection of the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through him, we have received grace in our apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles on the behalf of his name. Let's skip down, skip down, skip down, skip down. Okay. So the condemnation, this section is called the condemnation of the righteous, is Romans 1 and 18. 
uh, all the way to the end. But it says in 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. So these people are not godly. They are not righteous. Righteous means right. So they are unrighteous and ungodly. They're not right. So his wrath is revealed from heaven. His domain, God's domain, of people, and is revealed against the people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. What truth is he talking about? Hmm? What truth is he referring to? Let's keep going. Because what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them. Is Paul here saying that the spirit has revealed anything to these men, that the spirit speaks to them? No, he's not. For since, and I'll continue 20 verse, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, here it is, because they are understood through what he has, through what has been made. So through the creation, we can infer two things about God, his power and his divinity. That something transcends this world, we can be understand through the this world. That something is remarkably, unimaginably powerful, we can understand that through this world as well. Notice Paul didn't say the guy's divinity. can be understood through the spirit speaking to people. These aren't Christians. Spirit isn't talking to them. However, the testimony of natural revelation is loud and clear. So they are holding that truth back by their actions, the unrighteousness and ungodliness. He continues. So people are without excuse for although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks, but they became futile in their thoughts and their senseless hearts were darkened. So that knowledge of God that came from creation was suppressed. They didn't obey God. They didn't worship him. They are without an excuse because their thoughts became futile, pointless. And after their thoughts became pointless, their hearts were darkened. Heart the emotional, the, the place of desire. There's no light. There's no knowledge. There is ignorance. We desired the wrong things. We became blind in our chasing of our hearts. We don't see what's in our hearts because the heart is darkened. 
So although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for an image resembling mortal human beings or birds or four footed animals or reptiles. Okay. Uh, so just to recap, anti intellectualism within Christianity and more specifically within Pentecostalism seems to arise from two beliefs. First, there is the belief that anything that is extra biblical or outside of scripture is itself not uh, compatible with God's approval or God's use. God can't use it. And you can't use it uh, to 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 come to knowledge. Uh, the, the scripture is the only source of knowledge biblical knowledge, uh, uh, godly knowledge or theology, which is knowledge of God. So that's that's the first claim. And the second belief seems to be that if you do rely on something outside of Scripture, then the Holy Spirit is not providing that information to you. So the Holy Spirit needs to speak to you and you can't rely on your own uh, faculties uh, to, to get knowledge about God because that has to be guided through the Holy Spirit. So which is kind of the same thing, but they're a little different. So since the Holy Spirit wrote scripture, according, you know, in the sense that he inspired people uh, to write it, then the Holy Spirit it's not considered outside of scripture because you could make the case that, well, the Holy spirit is extra biblical. He's not words on a page where, but he inspired these, the people who wrote it. So in that sense, they could argue that the Holy scripture is a response and a part of the Holy spirit is uh, scripture as well. Yeah, I had to tell my kids to be quiet. Uh, so in response to that belief, that anti-intellectualism, we pulled up Romans 1 that shows two things. One, that creation, natural revelation, can show that there is a divine uh, deity and that he's all powerful or very powerful. He, he's he, he has eternal power. That's what he says. Okay. There is a deity and that deity has eternal power. But eternal means not capable of dying or does not cease to exist. So then in that sense, God is infinite in his life and his existence. Now we turn to Peter. And Peter in Peter, we we get the word apologetics. Okay, 1 Peter 3.15. Apologia. Peter actually uses that word. He says, 1 Peter 3.15, but set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope you possess. Yet, do it with courtesy and respect, keeping a good conscience, and having a good will, so that those who slander your conduct in Christ may be put 
to shame when they accuse you. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if God wills it, than for doing evil. That is amazing. That's amazing. So here we find that we have to be ready to give a defense, right? It's interesting that that he doesn't say, be ready to let the Holy Spirit speak to you or be ready to listen to the Holy Spirit. But he says, you do this. It's your responsibility to give a defense for the hope that lies within you. Make sure you do it within a good conscience, with pure intentions. Uh, do it with courtesy. Be nice about it. Do it with respect. So that people who lie on you and, and talk about you because you're Christian or whatnot, they're going to be ashamed when they try to slander you. Then he says it's better to suffer for doing good than it is to suffer for evil if God wills you to suffer. Which is mind blowing. So that's that. We'll end it there. We'll just wrap it up. Intellectualism seems to have at least two two tenets uh, within Pentecostalism uh, and the Christian within Christianity in, in general, but specifically within Pentecostalism. The first tenet is that anything that is extra biblical is not uh, commissioned by God for use. Uh, to acquire uh, knowledge about God or understanding of scripture. And then it seems like there's a second uh, belief that the spirit must speak to you and lead you in interpreting scripture uh, apart from uh, anything that, that could be considered head knowledge or objective facts. It needs to be an intimate inward speaking uh subjective experience and without that then it's just head knowledge which is a disparaging uh term uh used to put down information uh that can be demonstrated uh studied and learned and researched so but we have found that Romans 1 teaches that creation which is outside of scripture can can tell about God's eternity, his power, his eternal power, and his deity, his, his godness, uh, his divinity, uh, and that we should be ready to give a reason and answer a defense, an apologia, which is where we get the word apologetics, to anyone who has a question about our hope. He does not say that that defense needs to come from us channeling the spirit or listening really deeply before we answer and, and responding as if the spirit would give us information in that moment uh, pertinent to that conversation. Uh, but he says we must be ready. Right. So that's a that's a something that's a personal responsibility. And this is not to say that the Holy Spirit can't use our study. Uh, because that would be the anti-intellectual. Uh, but that the my position is that the Holy Spirit can use anything we study, whether that's logic and argumentation, and that the Holy Spirit in Scripture, he has always used those great those men in, in the greatest way who did more to prepare themselves. Uh, Isaiah was a scholar. Paul was a scholar and wrote many, much more of the New Testament than anyone else. Uh, just the major prophets were had had positions. 
So that God prefers to use people who invest in themselves and to position themselves with knowledge, with information, with skill, with strategy. I mean, look at Moses, who was trained and taught by Egyptians in the palace. Look at Joseph, who was also uh, a ruler and developed skills on leading and God used him. Uh, I mean, just go all through scripture. You'll find people with with talents and abilities that God uh, prefers to use. So and and sometimes people have abilities that they were not aware of, uh, like uh, Gillian. I mean, Gideon uh, or uh, David before he became king. It was just a shepherd in the fields, although he knew he killed a bear and a lion. So with that being said, apologetics then should not be something to be feared, but something to be explored, to explore rational argumentation and discourse in defending the, the, the Christian doctrines and seeing that defense as something that the Holy Spirit can use and illuminate your knowledge of scripture and bring you more knowledge of God. Today, that says this has been our thought decoded. And we have decoded the anti-intellectualism of within Christianity, specifically focusing on some uh, tenets of the Pentecostal church. Thank you. Have a good day.